Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Bethany Allen Abrahamian. I'm the China reporter at Axios, and I'm here today at Hudson Institute to speak with Nuri Turkel, a senior fellow here at Hudson, about his new book, which we have right here called No Escape. Um, and let me first introduce Nuri. He is a senior fellow here. He is a lawyer. Uh, he is the vice chair of the U.S. Um, Commission on International Religious Freedom, and he is co-founder of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. He is one of the most prominent uh, people who has been speaking out about the Uyghur uh, situation, the Uyghur repression, and the Uyghur genocide in China uh, for years. And I'm thrilled today to be able to talk to him about his book, learn more about his, his life story, his, his hard work, uh, the challenges that he has faced, and what he sees going forward uh, for, for the Uyghur people. So thank you so much for joining us today, Nuri. Thank you very much for coming to have this conversation with me, Bethany. I would first like to ask you about the book project itself. How did it get started? When did you start thinking of writing a book, and, and how did it come to be? Thank you. Um, if I may, I'd like to begin by thanking my uh, colleagues here at, here at Hudson Institute um, and leadership and uh, the support team, professional staff, for sharing their knowledge and supporting my work um, over the year. Um, I've been, I've been uh, very pleased to have this opportunity to work with uh, world-class scholars um, at Hudson. Uh, the, the idea of writing this book has been in my mind for a long time, but I never thought that I would be writing memoir uh, early in life. Uh, in early 2019, uh, you know very well about the frustration that many of us who work in the human rights field, not getting enough attention on the, the atrocities being committed in China and Xi Jinping's China. I was presented this opportunity at the Oslo Freedom Forum to do uh, stage talk, the opening uh, uh, speech. And in my speech, I highlighted uh, what is happening, what was happening, and why it's happening, and what should we do about it. Um, I highlighted the uh, surveillance aspect. I highlighted the collective punishment aspect. I also highlighted the willful ignorance, a feigning ignorance of uh, uh, the business leaders, uh, such as the CEO of uh, uh, Volkswagen. And also I brought up the, uh, the Olympic 1936 to make it relatable to the audience that uh, there's so much similarities between what happened to the Jewish people during the Second World War and what is happening in China today. And then after the uh, talk, I got a lot of uh, compliments um, and, and uh, several authors um, came to me and suggested that I should consider uh, turning this 10-minute speech into a book. So I started with that. And also, um, uh, that was the trigger, but I also believe in um, the power of storytelling. Um, when you, uh, for ordinary people, average people, people who are not closely following the politics in China like you and I, uh, usually don't see this has been happening uh, for so long, or as long as, I, as, as long as I have been breathing. And as someone who lived through all of it, uh, both inside and outside of China, I thought that the story should be told by somebody who had been a direct and indirect victim of the atrocities committed by communist China. So that's one. And then two, um, I felt that I owed to the Uyghur community, uh, owed to the world, uh, to uh, share stories of those who have not had the type of opportunity and platform that I had. Um, and then finally, I wanted to um, use this book and this opportunity to uh, tell the world or educate the world that uh, this is no longer about a group of uh, oppressed ethnic religious minority in China. This is about the future. Uh, you know, what kind of future do we want? Do we want to stop this kind of atrocities happening on World's Watch, or do you want to keep making an uh, empty promise that never again? Yeah. I was really struck when I was um, reading your book, and I just have my copy here because I, I, I took a lot of notes as I was reading. Um, to me, because I cover this issue closely, a lot of the stories that you told about the, the Uyghurs who have been put in the camps uh, but have been able to leave 
uh, and tell their story. I was familiar with their stories, but what was so interesting about hearing you or reading you write about them was you, you know them. And you, you don't just, it's not that you just met them, but you, you know what they're, where they grew up and you know, the culture is one that you share. And because of that, I felt that I could really almost live with them what they were experiencing. And I found that to be very powerful. Uh, another thing that I um, really gleaned from this was your own personal story. Right. So I hope that you can share with everyone watching today some, some information about that. We know you as a lawyer. We know you as someone who's very courageous on the international stage. But your, your childhood is fascinating and says a lot about the trajectory of, of you know, the experience of Uyghurs in China. So uh, you know, start, if you can, with where you were born, even the building that you were born in. Right. I, you know... I never thought, uh, especially um, coming to the United States, pursuing graduate education and becoming a lawyer and living, working in the nation's capital, and uh, most importantly, after becoming an American citizen, I thought that my past uh, history, particularly the way that my parents brought me to this world, almost irrelevant. You know, who would like to talk about tragic uh, uh, stories? Even my close associates, close friends did not know that I was born in a re-education camp during the height of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and there's, there's so much relevancy uh, to today's uh, suffering that many Uyghurs are um, enduring. Uh, for one, uh, for starters, uh, guilt by association. My mom and my, my mother and my father did not commit any crime. Their crime to the Red Guards were, um, my mom happened to be a daughter of a Uyghur nationalist and my dad being a cousin of or a relative of somebody or uh, we, uh, individuals who migrated to the Soviet Union uh, controlled Uzbekistan back in the 60s. Uh, so guilt by association. And also the, the other uh, aspect very similar uh, is the way that uh, they forced my mom to go through indoctrination, like verbal abuses, uh, physical abuses, uh, dehumanization uh, that uh, people in, uh, in these days been reading in the news. And finally, uh, the collective punishment aspect, even though that's a different type of uh, uh, setup that the Red Guards um, used to punish and tra uh, transform Uyghurs, specifically the Uyghurs uh, who are pious uh, and uh, uh, you know, following their way, Uyghur traditional life, and intellectuals. This is also another similar. My dad is a university educated uh, teacher um, who was sent to a labor camp to perform agricultural labor. Um, when my mother was taken into the camp, um, she was very young, uh, a few months pregnant with me. So she gave a birth to me in the uh, re-education camp. Before, while she was pregnant, she got injured. So she was in cast while uh, chest down while she delivered me. You know, my uh, as a as a father of two young kids who've been to the uh, the hospital uh, when my wife was delivering, I know how difficult it is to even go through a normal delivery process, let alone being in cast and in that environment. So um, this makes it very special. Um, this helped me to build a special bond with my parents. My mother um, is uh, 72. She's still uh, in uh, China's controlled Xinjiang, uh, East Turkestan, that Uyghurs like to call. Um, I haven't seen her since my law school graduation in 2004, and I don't know if I will ever see her again. Uh, uh, tragically, I recently lost my father about a month ago when I was on an official trip to Uzbekistan representing USERF. Um, he, I heard the news uh, on my arrival that he passed away. But most heart-wrenching aspect of that, I knew that this was coming. Uh, I thought that I was prepared, but I was not, what I was not prepared is the fact that I could not even um, uh, able to uh, hold my mom uh, when she's going through, when she lost uh, her husband of 53 years. Uh, and also that close, Tashkent and Urumqi is about the same distance from here to New York. It's very close, same you know, culture, same environment. Um, and I, because I got sanctioned uh, last December by uh, a Chinese regime. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, policy announcement by the United States government that includes the Olympic boycott, additional Globemax sanction, entity list designation. So it made it impossible. You know, it's easy for those of us who don't have that kind of uh, childhood family connection. But to me, uh, with that sanction, 
I did not even have a, a, a basic freedom to be there for my mom and, and carry my dad's casket. Yeah. Um, we can get to uh, you know, the reasons that you, that you have been separated from your parents for so long and some of the dangers. Yeah. Um, you wrote, I just thought this was such an interesting thing, that the, the re-education camp that your mother was, and she was, I think, 19 years old. Yes. 19 years old and just a few months pregnant when they, when they took her in there. It wasn't hidden away. It was like in a, in a city. It was yeah. in, just sort of in downtown Kashgar, yes. right? Yes, yes. And so then um, when you know, she was eventually released, you were released as a baby. Eventually, after the Cultural Revolution, that building was torn down and there was a movie theater, a yeah. mall with a movie theater yeah. built there. Yeah. And you used to go there yeah. and yeah. see movies there, right. which I think is just a very interesting like, way of viewing the trajectory of China yeah. at that, at that yeah. time. It is, it, is, it, is, it, it is almost fascinating that you walk by uh, a building where your mother was tortured and where you were kept could not even see the uh, uh, natural daylight, causing a lot of health uh, concerns. Some people even um, suggested to my mom that I was uh, not going to make it because of the, uh, the health concerns uh, that were associated with my early childhood life. Um, the building was a Russian built, a giant uh, a building, a, a building with a giant uh, a big windows and doors. Um, and then when they turned that into um, a, um, before they uh, turned that into a mall, uh, it was so close to the area that my uncles had shops to sell uh, import export products. Um, I was walking by literally almost like in a regular basis and close to the center of the Kashgar, uh, the central square. And then after that turned into a mall, one of my uncles ended up opening a shop in that mall. So um, ironic, every time when we walked by, mom said, oh, that was the window. Uh, I tried to peek out to see. Uh, my mother could see me outside the building. Um, and I was just longing to see if your dad will walk by and arrive. So I, I heard that story. This is why I genuinely believe that the Uyghurs never been um, having a, never had a chance to live like a normal human being. It started with, you know, even in my own life, even be, w before I was born to this world. So this is very personal to me. Sometimes when I share uh, stories of others, uh, people like to hear about my story, but the other people's story is much more horrific, uh, heart-wrenching, as you, as you know as a re uh, from your previous reportings. And another part of this trajectory that, that you mentioned is in the 1980s, there was something of a cultural flowering, a, a brief period. Yeah. Um, when Kashgar, was, where, where the Chinese local authorities rebuilt some of the traditional things. Right. What has happened now, though? It's a polar opposite. Um, when, you know, this is something that I always say, um, using the, whatever the platform, uh, official, private, uh, whenever the governments uh, respect individual rights, uh, human rights, uh, religious freedom, uh, cultural rights, you will naturally have a stable society, naturally have a happy, uh, relatively happy population. Even though there's some sort of political repression exist, uh, some people just willfully choose to uh, look the other way about the political aspect. That was the life of the Uyghur people. So they, they were, um, I was able to speak my mo mother language, my native language, which I still do. Uh, I was able to uh, enjoy cultural and religious life following uh, my dad to go to mosque for uh, during the uh, religious holidays were permitted. Uh, even if you, if you do that today, you will easily get a, a, a label, a religious extremism, extremist, as being the state employee and also underage child. Those are the things that are very, very normal. And also, um, this, this may be a news to most people that I, and I grew up in a university campus. We had some Han Chinese uh, chi, uh, professors and they were respectful, uh, even you know, as small as not touching the food when they come to visit your house, unless the host uh, invite them to do. That kind of basic respect has gone uh, today. It's impossible to even see a parent taking the kid to a place of worship. It's gone. Uh, and also the other thing that is so remarkable, I saw a cultural revival. Uh, the first uh, Uyghur language publishing house was established uh, by the state uh, publishing textbooks. Today, those editors who uh, either worked at that publishing house 
or editors who publish, or the authors publish books through their publishing house are languishing in the camps. So it, it's, 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 just a, it's just an incredibly different world. And then, um, as I wrote in the book, they carved out a, uh, a, um, an area in a Chinese elementary school to build uh, a mausoleum for one of the most significant um, uh, intellectuals in the Turkic history, Yusuf Hasajib. Uh, and this person is, is known uh, in entire Eurasia. And then finally, they organized um, preservation, uh, reorganizing of the Uyghur classical music, 12 Mokam. So if, if the Chinese said, okay, what can we do to make it better? They should look at some of the policies that were working then because they had a little bit more reasonable leadership uh, in Beijing uh, that turned into a genocidal uh, regime today. Yeah. And you were talking about basically the 1980s, yeah. right? Yeah. So tell us what changed along the way to bring us where we are today. The Uyghur people's fate, Uyghur people's life, Uyghur people's um, uh, environment always have uh, uh, somewhat related to the global uh, uh, geopolitics or regional geopolitics. Um, the life was okay for the Uyghur people, even though there's a, a, a serious political repression. Um, in the early 90s, after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union, after the Gulf War, uh, and after the Tiananmen Square pro-democracy movement uh, in Beijing, I think Chinese leadership promised themselves, uh, we will not uh, have the same type of faith as the Soviets, and we will not uh, tolerate any type of political dissent. So domestic uh, uh, June 4th pro-democracy movement in the late 90s, uh, 80s, and then the uh, fall of uh, Soviet Union, uh, uh, a neighboring Turkic state declaring independence, made the Chinese nervous, as has been the case uh, with the establishment of what's originally known as Shanghai Five, but now Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO. It was established at the request of, the, uh, request of the, uh, Russia and China, uh, which is a regional security uh, organization today. And then uh, they just build up this pressure, both inside and outside of China, created enemy in the Uyghur people, and the rest of it, uh, history, as you know. Yeah. What, what is it that, China, that, the, that the Chinese Communist Party wants in Xinjiang? Two things, uh, uh, unconditional uh, loyalty and subjugation. So the Chinese uh, to the Communist Party, uh, Uyghur's way of life, uh, Uyghur culture, uh, identity, even the physical appearance, something always been treated as uh, a threat uh, or sign of disloyalty. Uh, the otherness has been part of the uh, overall thinking uh, in the leadership, uh, state propaganda, and also even the society. I, I lived in inland China for f five years, four years in suburb of Xi'an, one year in Beijing. Even with my student status and, and kind of uh, gainful employment in Beijing, uh, I always treat it as other, even by cab drivers. So there's a, a, a systematic um, racial profiling uh, that stemmed from the, 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 uh, the concept uh, initially uh, created by, uh, put, put out by social scientists, Chinese social scientists, and then adopted by the CCC, uh, CCP propaganda, now become a so, uh, social uh, attitude. And the other piece is subjugation. The, the Chinese tried different methods um, from the beginning, uh, since 1949. People should know that there was a country called East Turkestan uh, before Stalin uh, handed over to Mao. Uh, in 1949, after assassination, in, in, after the collapse of the government, uh, resulting from the assassination of the uh, most senior uh, leadership on the air, airplane crash, so they they tried different methods, different uh, ways, and then um, after Xi Jinping took took office, will become a, a, a become a supreme leader of China, the things take a, a dramatic change. Um, they were initially very. Um, uh, careful with the, the language. They always portray uh, social stability, uh, ethnic harmony type of propaganda to squelch national uh, Uyghur resentment. And then uh, since 2015, 2017, the narrative completely changed. As you reported, they used uh, terms like uh, no mercy, rounded up, everyone should be rounded up. And there's a very little resentment uh, within China. So the, it's both uh, state-sponsored um, um, uh, 
social uh, and, and racial profiling discrimination that were part of the practice for a long time that codified and, and enforced through a state policy in the last several yeah. years. I think one of the, one of the challenges that, that I feel like I face in conveying what's happening in Xinjiang to Uyghurs is that some of it is familiar, at least to a Western audience. Okay, religious ethnic minority in a concentration camp. We have a schema for that, you know, because of the Holocaust. But a lot of it isn't. There isn't a simple way to explain the, the techno-authoritarianism that yeah. people who aren't in camps face yeah. and the, the total surveillance state. You use yeah. the term, I think, a digital dictatorship. Authoritarianism. A, a digital authoritarianism. Um, maybe starting with um, the, the digital authoritarianism, if you can describe what that is, what it looks like, how it affects the daily lives of, of Uyghurs there, and what it's for. We, um, we rightfully have been focusing on those who have been detained in the camps, even based on the Chinese own uh, white paper uh, 1.3 million Uyghurs uh, uh, went through re-education since 2015. That's a staggering number, uh, if you add them up. Um, and 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 these practices are still ongoing, uh, but we often forget or ignore uh, the life of the Uyghurs outside of the camps, who have been subject to uh, surveillance in their every aspect of their lives, um, iris scan. Uh, voice uh, scans, and this resulted in something very serious to the Uyghur community around the world, uh, which was the family members made a, a conscious decision to delete the foreign contacts, including children, grandchildren, uh, even spouses from their contacts, worrying that uh, when they're walking down the street, uh, the mobile command machine uh, or the police uh, stop them and check, uh, do a mobile uh, device scan. Uh, if that data scan uh, catch something, as reported by uh, Human Rights Watch report, the IJOP, Integrated Joint Operating Platform, you will be profiled, your data will be sent to the police, and you could be subject to uh, uh, re-education, uh, as they call it. Um, that's one piece. The other piece is that um, early on, um, they did this free medical checkup, um, offering free medical checkup even for people who had health insurance like my parents, uh, decent health insurance, if, my, if I, I, I might add, to collect DNA samples. Uh, even one of the American uh, medical scientists, uh, Kenneth, Co Kenneth Kidd at, um, at Yale Medical School, used the Uyghur DNA samples uh, and, uh, with the help of um, a Chinese Minister of Public, uh, uh, Public Security official at his lab here in the United States. And also the... Um, uh, the, uh, the facial uh, recognition software that also created uh, is such an impossible uh, living environment. For example, if you are going to your parents' house or relative's house, if you're not previously recorded in the facial recognition database, you will not be able to allow to go in. So imagine that every uh, apartment complex have the type of uh, uh, doors that we see in the New York metro station with cameras. So that's one piece. And then more recently, they added a QR code on your doors. Uh, so they, they know what kind of people they live there and what kind of activities, contacts that they have. So every aspect of uh, the Uyghur lives have been uh, surveilled. And in the, the, I think that the, the most important thing that I think people should take away from this part of the conversation is that to the extent American public, American investors are investing in China's tech authoritarianism, not realizing that this will be a bigger problem for the rest of the world to deal with. As we speak, there are more than 80 countries around the world not only adopted the Chinese surveillance techniques, but expanding it on their own. So this is something metastasizing that people should be, uh, should be concerned uh, because you know, this, is, um, this will affect uh, lives of millions of people when it comes to privacy. Um, especially in the United States, as Americans, we love our privacy. Uh, the, the, this kind of intrusive uh, surveillance may become a new norm in other parts of the world. And then the other piece is that how, what does that mean for a democratic system, democratic uh, freedom? 
are we going to be allow ourselves to have a government or opposition group to monitor your voting records? We may not have that problem here, but around the world, it may, uh, it may be the case. And also the security concern. So, um, and, 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 and this has also already been reported in the United States that um, commerci commercialization of uh, personal data without permission. Uh, we have actually, this is already part of our lives in here. So there are many uh, 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 important aspects that people need to pay attention to. So some, sometimes people think that um, the Chinese developed uh, these techniques, uh, surveillance technology uh, in Xinjiang. Actually, it came from the other parts of the, uh, uh, China, but, but only tested with its effectiveness now being exported. This is also part of China's global uh, ambition using technology to expand their uh, influence. I'm very pl uh, pleased and grateful for the United States government focusing on uh, Chinese tech firms. This week, uh, there was a news about um, Biden administration uh, sanctioning the world's largest camera maker, uh, security camera, surveillance camera, high, high, high vision, vision. Which, which has been enabling, facilitating the ongoing genocide yeah. against the Uyghurs. Yeah, there was the, um, the Kyrgyz, Chinese Kyrgyz man right. who, um, Old Buck, uh, Old Buck, right. Turdukun, who yeah. came to the U.S. just recently, and part of his interesting uh, and important testimony is he recognized the Hike Vision logo on the cameras that were in the mass internment camp that he was in, um, and you know, so that's real first-person evidence of the use of Hike Vision cameras in the in the camps and and what they're for. Of course, we we've, we've seen that through government tenders. Yeah. We knew that they were right. building them there, so that's. Um, what else have you seen from the U.S. and um, and maybe other countries that's already happened? Uh, and, and what do you want to see that hasn't happened I, yet? Um, I interviewed, um, I had the pleasure to interview uh, Kai Strutmatter, uh, the author of the, uh, the book that everyone should read, um, We Have Been Harmonized. He spent a lot of time in China, uh, including a visit to Xinjiang. Uh, after the, uh, after the news broke out that there was something bad happening. Um, he had something very interesting in the book, which was um, that most of the US hospitals, uh, schools, prison system, use Chinese security mm -hmm. camera. This is already uh, widespread in the United States. And even that book mentioned uh, US embassy in Kabul, uh, now uh, closed. And one military base, even in the United States, using high vision camera. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, politicization. When, when uh, those of us called attention to this uh, tech authoritarianism, digital authoritarianism, people politicize, but they will forget what these entities are all about. Uh, in the same book, uh, there's also another interesting information that each of these companies have a red fund directly related, uh, connected to the uh, CCP leadership. That means that their business model, uh, the technology sharing, even certain degree of investment, all connected to the CCP. Um, in, in one instance, um, the, the author mentioned that when you walk to iFly Tech uh, lobby, there's a slogan that said, we rule China today, we will rule the, chi uh, the world uh, tomorrow. So that's their ambition. It's quite a slogan. Yeah, quite. Oh, or a threat. <laughs> yes, it's a threat. So, so I think that the American people are gradually waking up because our government, uh, in bipartisan spirit, doing something right about this particular issue. But I worry that the uh, Eastern Central European countries, uh, uh, even some Western uh, European countries, are still not really appreciating the magnitude, uh, seriousness of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, I want to get into some of the stories that, that you spend so much of your book on, um, especially stories about, about women. You, you really give so much attention to what, what women have suffered. Can you pick maybe one or two of the women that you wrote about and talk about what happened to them, especially as women, yeah. uh, in the camps and also outside of the camps? Um, I had the pleasure to work with um, the Uyghur camp survivors. I could have interviewed all of them, but um, because of the limited space that I will have on the book, I only uh, spoke with uh, three, uh, uh, Kalbunur, uh, uh, Zumret, and uh, Mihrgul. Uh, Kalbunur is a, a camp instructor. He was, she was um, assigned to teach uh, to the detainees. 
um, most horrifying thing that um, I've heard from her was um, even at her house that she was subject to um, uh, various abuses, even at her house. This was, was this the Becoming Family? Yes, this is part of the uh, Becoming to, Family program. Tell us about that, because I think this is one of those things that maybe specialists know about, but a broader audience yeah. may not, because it's a special kind of horror. Yes. A couple of years ago, we learned about this uh, program, um, let me call it a program, um, through a reporting done by Darren, Darren Byler. It was a very extensive report. Um, essentially, what the Chinese has done is to send um, a group of Chinese cadres to the homes of the Uyghur people uh, to eat and sleep uninvited. Um, Anyone can appreciate how annoying, how offensive that can be if somebody comes to your house and try to join you in your bed and join you in your meal. And, and importantly, using your own family to spy against you, children in this case. Um, this is still ongoing. Uh, I interviewed uh, Zumret, and she, she was also experienced this becoming a family program. Uh, a, a, they call them relative. Uh, they will check up on you. They come to talk to your uh, children when you're not around, and they can ask uh, questions like, what do you guys talk when we're not at home? And an, an honest answer uh, by a, ch a child, a children, could cause a big trouble. Uh, in some instance, could lend you into the, uh, the camp. Um, Is it questions like, uh, have you seen mommy or daddy praying? Like praying. This kind of a question. Um, do they t tell you to do certain things that when we are around, uh, you know, they have this thing called two-faced crime. Mm. Um, and also the sexual violence that I've been hearing about this is, is, is just simply uh, outrageous and heartbreaking. Um, and they, I profiled in the book, uh, they just specifically demand um, a favor, a uh, sexual favor, when they were uh, part of, when they come to stay. And the, the, the women who, are, uh, who have no male household uh, or husbands taken to the camp are the most vulnerable ones. Because they are uh, based on the stories that I put in the book and based on other conversation that I had with the camp survivors. This is still an ongoing. Because you know um, some people may object to this um, description, but the Uyghur woman um, traditionally, uh, historically, societally perceived as a sexual object in China. Um, and this is not only me saying, the Chinese embassy put out a, a, a tweet uh, a year or so ago calling Uyghur women as a baby-making machine. After we protested, they took it down. This was when Sui Tianke was, a, was ambassador uh, here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the embassy can put out stuff like that, so you can imagine what the social concept, yeah. uh, the attitude could be to a vulnerable uh, group of uh, Uyghur women. My, um, uh, the, the Uyghur activists that I interviewed, uh, the camp survivors, reminded me of the Jewish woman uh, who survived the Holocaust and uh, shared their stories. And I, I had the pleasure to work with some Holocaust survivors here at home in the UK. It just, the uh, Mihrigul, uh, uh, Zumret, and Kadmul reminded, reminded me of those courageous women tell the world. And another uh, important aspect that I, th I think was a conversation, the, we talked about the Cultural Revolution re-education program, but today's uh, collective punishment has so much similarities to what the Jewish people gone through during the Second World War. For example, the forced labor, uh, using the Olympic to glorify the regime, uh, taking children away, focusing, targeting women. There's so much similar, even some of the slogans. Um, you know, they use the term disturbingly final solution in some of the Chinese documents. You talk about taking the children away. That's a reference to some of these state-run orphanages, right. right? Where when both of the parent, one or both of the parents are in the camps, and there's this child, and they put them in there. But they don't teach them Uyghur. They only teach them Mandarin. They teach them to say, "I love the Communist Party. I'm not Muslim." Yeah. I mean, it's uh, and there's. I mean, there was an estimate in the Washington Post that there were. 800,000. 800,000 children affected. That's by this. more than the people in the nation's capital. <sighs> The uh, population yeah. in Washington, D.C. Yeah. is about 750. Yeah. We're talking about more people, more kids than yeah. the population of Washington, D.C. And this, is, this has important international legal ramifications, right. potentially. Right. Um, we can talk about, I think, the, you know, creating the legal case that right. this is a genocide. I know yeah. that under the Rome Statute, the 
forcible removal, removal, transfer of children from one group to another, is itself alone yeah. enough to say that it's a genocide. Right, right, yeah. right. And the, uh, the uh, deliberate, systematic prevention of natural population growth, yeah. that has also been documented. Um, the other pieces, uh, in part and whole, this, this destruction of a, a group of people. So the, the last two, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, sterilization, population control, and uh, separ child separation, were some of the most important uh, factors uh, for the United States government, uh, Secretary Pompeo initially, and then Secretary Blinken, calling it a genocide. Um, and that, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, share a story. Um, I, I was giving a talk at UCLA Law School and this, right around the time that uh, uh, the investigative reporting that you've done on leaked documents. Uh, a young student came to me and asked me if I could help um, to save his sister. And my question was naturally, what happened to your sister? He said that my mom was uh, a very successful publisher. My dad was uh, working with her, and both of them are detained. Recently, mom was transferred to um, a factory to perform uh, forced labor. And then I said, what happened to your sister? He said that uh, she is with my aged, uh, ailing grandma, grandmother. If something happens to her, and my sister will be sent to a state-run orphanage. This is just one of the many stories. And then This American Life profiled um, a father in, 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 in Istanbul who recognized his son yeah. in uh, a state-run orphanage uh, propaganda material. I, I, you know, this is one of the many cases that I personally heard, uh, interacted with, um, it's heart-wrenching. You know, what kind of people will take your children away from you? Um, you know, this sounds like a very a basic human conversation, but policymakers should ask themselves, what will, what will happen to them if somebody take away their children uh, from their wives, uh, will end up recognizing in, in, in a video, uh, a promotional video somewhere? And what if your children don't recognize you and calling somebody else as a father. So these kind of things uh, keeps me awake at night, uh, specifically what happened to the Uyghur woman and children. You know, what, can, what kind of future can you have when you don't have women and children? It's, it's a very simple question. And Chinese authority, the policymakers, the architects know exactly what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So it bothers me so much in a personal level when people are still debating whether this is genocide or not. I mean, there's even a, there's a Chinese government document or speech that refers to breaking the lineage. Yeah. It's like cutting out the root and breaking yeah. the lineage. I mean, it's, that's just, this is the point. Like, yeah. we, we don't want the next generation right. of Uyghurs to be Uyghurs yeah. in, in a breaking cultural Breaking the connection, or lineage, or religious... and roots. Very yeah. specific. Yeah, very, very specific. And that's a policy. That's a policy yeah. statement. In Chinese system, you don't have to have, you know, uh, like we do, the think tanks picking up issues, the study, the debate, and they don't have a Congress to debate, and there's no reporters to report. There's nothing, none of this is available. If some Chinese officials chants a slogan like that, it becomes a policy. And we're seeing that as exactly being implemented. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, you, you talk about the forced sterilization, um, and what's, I mean, there's many horrifying aspects of that, but some of it is just, just tr so just truly pointless cruelty. The, the woman in the book, was it Zumrat who was 48? Yeah, Zumrat and then Kabner, both of them. Yeah, 48 years old, forced to, they both had to go uh, undergo a forced, a surgical forced yeah. sterilization yeah. At, at that age. Yes, Zumrat is still suffering yeah. uh, serious health issues. Um, she has been hospitalized a number of times. This is public, this has been, they are so courageous, uh, and these such a, private matters, yeah. people don't casually talk yeah. about. Even um, uh, Turs and I going to see a BBC sharing that uh, 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 rape that she experienced. This is all you know, unusual circumstances, yeah. but these brave women uh, feel compelled to share these stories. Um, in the case of Kalbunar, you know, she was not even planning to have another uh, baby. Yeah. And she was already close to 50, a middle-aged woman and they force her to go through forced sterilization. It's yeah. cruel. Yeah. It's inhuman. Yeah. Um, uh, I know that. Um, so the, the U.S. has led a lot on this on this issue, and, and your work has been very important Thank you. in that. 
What are some of the specific actions? We've, we've talked about this already, but um, there's been a, a genocide designation. Yep. There have been sanctions. Yep. There have been these technology companies put on the entities list. Yes. Um, there's also a very, and we have hardly touched on this, and, and we, we need to, is to talk about forced labor mm -hmm. and supply chain issues, and then the, you know, the, the, the new, the, the act that was passed recently, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention yeah. Act. Can you walk us through um, what is this forced labor? Why, why is it happening? Yeah. And what is the U.S. doing to try to get these products out of global supply chains? This, um, the issue, the very issue that you raised uh, makes this issue even more relatable, relevant to general American public or American people's interest, even pockets. Um, the forced labor uh, is, not, is not something new to the Uyghur people. Um, I, you know, we talked about my early life. Um, in, this, in the city of Kashgar, where I was uh, born and raised, um, the Chinese authorities used the Uyghurs to um, perform uh, uh, forced labor in irrig building irrigation system, picking cotton. So the cotton trade, picking cotton, has been uh, part of Uyghur life for a long, long time. There is an entity called Xinjiang Production uh, Construction uh, uh, Corps, uh, XPCC. The XPCC controls much of the cotton fields, uh, water resources, and they have been enslaving the Uyghur people in the last 40, 50 years. This has been ongoing. What is new is the fact that um, uh, this has become an industrial scale practice uh, in recent years. Uh, traditionally, those uh, global brands had their plant uh, on, in coastal cities. And because of this poverty el alleviation program that people give the Chinese government a lot of credit for, also created labor shortage. That labor shortage uh, compelled some businesses to move their uh, assembly line to uh, Xinjiang. There's a, a plenty of um, uh, natural resources. They don't have to transport. And plenty of agricultural products. And now the dirty coal that was used to build solar panels. And also it's a geographically convenient location. If you have a market, if you want to have a market access to Eurasia, there is it. Uh, there's a, over 600 miles international border uh, 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 land access to the Eurasian market. It's a, it's a huge market. Uh, uh, and and th those are the reasons that they uh, move their manufacturing uh, site uh, to that part of uh, the country. Um, what is new is that um, the Uyghur uh, forced labor has been used in uh, literally everything, uh, you know, including the PPEs that we use to save uh, lives, even to this day. The New York Times reported uh, that practice uh, a couple of years ago. And also um, the beauty products using Uyghur women's hair, uh, one shipment only. I asked my female friends to come up with a, a ballpark estimate how much how many women's head need to be shaved uh, to make a 13 tons of uh, beauty products or wigs. No one can give me any uh, accurate figure. Uh, that was only one shipment. And I, you, you mentioned in here that the, the women um, in the camps had their heads shaved. Yes. And I, I know that that particular shipment came from a factory that was very close to a detention facility. Right. So the idea here is that and this, this has such echoes of the Holocaust, yeah. as the women are put into the camps, their heads are shaved, and now that hair is being sold for yeah. profit. Yeah, and so, and so targeting uh, African-American community, yeah. calling it black gold, and targeting a, a, a American woman with a darker hair preference. Mm. So, uh, so those, and then the solar panel. Uh, my environmental friends always said, oh, we need to save the planet. At what cost? Uh, so these are the things that are very new. You know, I remember when I was in law school helping to edit a worker's manual for one of the sneaker makers who had a plant in the northeast China. Uh, this was like a legit business. They were paid uh, even less than uh, the others, but now it's a full-scale, industrial-scale uh, uh, slavery that we're dealing with. So the United States government, uh, for its credit, uh, done a lot of WROs, um, and now this legislation. Um, I, I, I commend the leadership in the US Congress, uh, and also uh, President Biden uh, 
should deserve some credit for signing it in such a short period of time. This, this piece of legislation become law literally in three weeks. It took a lot of time for us to get there, but it was pretty quick. Uh, my being sanctioned has something to do with this as well. Really? I didn't uh, know that. It's the timing. Uh, if you look at the timing, huh. Um, huh. Uh, the three things happened around that time. The Olympic boycott, yeah. additional uh, Globe Max sanction, and then the signing this law into yeah. uh, a bill to law or enactment of the uh, Weaver Forced Labor Prevention Act. But it's, 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 it's interesting timing, to say the least. Yeah. So what this law does is to push the responsibility over to the business to prove to the United States that they are not using forced labor, unless, uh, you know, otherwise they will, they will presume to be using forced labor. I think it's a smart strategy because, you know, in, in China there's a enforced internal migration. Even if you manage to stop the forced labor practices through legislation, legal uh, means, legal tools in Xinjiang, they can move it to a neighboring uh, uh, province. So, so with this kind of, uh, you know, pushing, it, uh, the, uh, the task over to the businesses, I think it's, it's one of the most effective ways. We shall see. This law is going to be, um, uh, will go into force, uh, will be starting to be in, implemented uh, next month, later uh, June 21 to be exact. Uh, but businesses may find a way to um, uh, ask for waiver uh, exceptions because the business community still have not been, uh, uh, community has not been really up to the plate yet. Um, I'll give you one example. In, in, um, uh, shortly after Putin invaded Ukraine, it took about two, three days for the international businesses to either pull out or suspend their business practices. To this day, um, if you count late 2016, uh, it's been almost six years that uh, the advocates who are trying to stop this practice have not been able to make one company, U.S. company, to make a pledge that they, they will not use was stop sourcing from Xinjiang. One or few of them tried, and they end up uh, face uh, end up being subject to state-sponsored uh, uh, boycott in China. Uh, so this this is a very uh, um, uh, complicated uh, a, a work. But this if this law is implemented, it will address some of the uh, lingering issues in U.S.-China trade since China cho joined the WTO. And I don't think that. You know, what on the earth that you will be able to solve the supply chain problem if you don't address this? Sometimes those um, uh, business leaders uh, or lobbyists who are pushing against trying to convince the Congress and the current administration that going hard on China on this particular issue will create more supply chain. But we cannot uh, handle something just, uh, you know, pushing it to the side or um, uh, cover it up. Uh, this has to be dealt. Uh, and also, I think this is also very important in the U.S.-EU um, uh, relationship as well. I was pleased that the matter was taken to G7 uh, in the last G7. Uh, they did not issue joint communique, but it was included in a uh, statement saying that we will uh, push back against uh, forced labor. I never thought that the, uh, the Uyghur issue will be, uh, would, would uh, make it to G7 conversation. So the Europeans have not figured out that... Uh, um, EU-China comprehensive agreement and investment is on hold. Uh, who knows what will happen to it, but I, I hope that the Europeans, Australians, the Japanese, the Canadians, uh, birds, uh, have something similar put in place so this will be a global effort. Otherwise, we will not be able to stop this modern-day slavery. Yeah, I, um, when I first heard that this law was, you know, people were drafting it, putting it together, I thought, I thought the idea behind it was really brilliant because at yeah. the time, you know, uh, you talk to CBP, yeah. you know, which is the Office uh, Customs and Border Protection, the office that's tasked yeah. with um, prevent, preventing. It's, it's already against the law for people right. to, you know, to bring products made with forced labor into the U.S. But the onus at that time was on this tiny office, you right. know, that's totally understaffed for yes. these really complex supply chain audits that you have to do um, with, with China. And to put the onus onto the company, I mean, it makes it. It at least makes it theoretically possible right. to enforce U.S. law as it already exists. Um, you raise an important point. Um, not only we didn't have um, a specific legal tools um, uh, or mandate that would address this issue, we're so understaffed. Our agencies, yeah. government agencies, we're talking about that particular office with about 15 people. The whole United States government yeah. Yeah. has about 15 people who are tasked to do this. 
And uh, the United States remain, remain to be the largest export destination for Xinjiang products, along with some European countries. Yeah, and, and so they basically weren't, almost weren't doing it, you know, relying on media reports to do it for right. them, which is understandable. So, I mean, I think that's a really great sign. It's, it's still very complicated and difficult because on the Chinese side, on the, you know, the Chinese government authorities have made it a bit next to impossible to do actual right. audits, right. on-the-ground audits. So, anyway, it's a whack-a-mole a bit. A absolutely. I, this is why I always um, emphasize the role of the consumers in the United States. You know, um, you have to create a, a, an un uncomfortable environment for both policymakers and business leaders that they cannot just ignore this. This is a case of this bill that we've been talking about. There was some reluctance uh, in some officials. Even we, we read that there was some pushback, uh, even some lobbying. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to this day didn't think it was a good idea to have this law. Um, so, so consumers need to create in an environment that our policymakers are forced to do the right thing. And also consumers also could have a huge role to play to make it costly for the businesses to continue this modern day slavery. Otherwise, you know, how do you, what else? I mean, there's one example during the um, Winter Olympics. I don't know who promoted this idea initially. Um, uh, it could be um, uh, those three Jewish um, uh, leaders who published um, an ad advertisement in New York Times calling for a, a boycott of um, NBC viewers, uh, viewership or mm -hmm. watching the game. Uh, the viewership dropped half during the games. Huh. That's significant. Yeah. Um, I don't know what has gone through the, uh, the executive at the NBC, but it was a huge, that's a consumer active, and that's a role. I mean, we live in a free society. People have a choice not to watch, not to buy things. Yeah. I mean, I know that one effect of, you know, of it, you know, it being labeled a genocide was that it was really difficult for advertisers, for you know, brands to be as ex to have as many right. to run as many ads, right. being so excited about the Olympics right. because it's because you know everyone knew that there was this you know um, well that there was a genocide right. going it, on. Speaking of uh, that important point that you remind me something, this genocide Olympic was sponsored by companies implicated already in the uh, forced labor practices. <laughs> yes. So. Um, and, and, and it's not that um, difficult. Uh, you know, some of them came to testify in Congress. They won't even acknowledge that there's something bad happening in that part of the world. It is just unconscious. And more importantly, this is un-American because, you know, we have a history, cotton trade history. This country has a history with slavery. We have a history of not listening to people who are facing genocidal campaign. So um, if this does not wake up, I don't know what will wake, uh, what will. And, and finally, I wanted to remind something um, uh, that the, the, the inaction by the state parties to the genocide convention, making this law, uh, making this treaty uh, almost irrelevant. Um, as of 2019, I think, uh, I believe there are over 150 state parties to the Genocide Convention. Under the Genocide Convention, Article 1 of the Genocide Convention, state parties obliged to call it out, stop, and punish. So those eight countries and parliaments, including our own, only did what they're supposed to do as a baby step number one. So nothing. Uh, you know, I, I am very pleased with the progress that um, uh, this cause in particular were able to make uh, in the United States with zero uh, financial investment. You know, passing these kind of major laws require a lot of uh, resources um, and lobbying effort. Um, I, I'm very pleased that the Congress did this without anyone investing a penny. Uh, and also, I'm very pleased that there's a bipartisan uh, policy responses by previous administration and the current administration. But what is missing is global effort. What is missing is a coherent plan. I don't think that anyone had put out a plan to stop this genocide, like the way that the international community came together, tried to push back against Putin's invasion in, in Ukraine. That's right, yeah. I remember um, what I found to be so incredibly disheartening, although it was the appropriate action, was when the International Olympic Committee, um, when Russia invaded yeah. Ukraine, called for uh, countries to cancel sporting events with right. Russia. Yeah. 
this was com right, coming off the heels right. of the Beijing Olympics when so many people had been urging the IOC to take action regarding China's genocide, and, and they had been totally silent. And I was, it was just, it was the, the juxtaposition of that was very hard to see. And then UN Secretary General Guterres, he went to Ukraine, yes. may, said the all the right thing, and to this day he has not said a word. Not, not a single thing. Yeah. He has never mentioned. Yes. That's right, he what's happening in China. He avoids actually Xinjiang. mentioning it. That's right, he's never So the hypocrisy is at best yeah. display. Yeah. Well, that, that transition is, I think, into the, the last thing that I want to talk about, which is the global implications of the Uyghur genocide. Now, the Uyghur genocide matters no matter what. The, yeah. you know, the, the dignity of the Uyghur people survival of yeah. the Uyghur people is important enough yeah. for everyone in the yeah. world to care about. But because of China's position, yeah. their ability to, to reshape and their, you know, the Chinese Communist Party's desire to reshape global institutions, it has even added weight and importance uh, in terms of the, you know, what kind of world the 21st century is going to be. What are the ways that the Chinese government has been trying to I don't know, make the world safe for authoritarianism, make the world safe for genocide, for whoever wants to commit it? That's an important question that everyone should be um, uh, uh, talking about. Um, as I alluded earlier, um, one might think uh, these horrific um, experiences that the Uyghurs have uh, been gone through is another human rights headache, a human rights problem. I think people are mistaken. Uh, it, it was a human rights concern about five, six years ago. But now uh, what the CCP doing, is doing is touching um, every aspect of our lives, whether it be a moral obligation, um, uh, historical concerns of regrets, um, uh, a, a technological uh, aspect of our lives, uh, or the products that we use at home, uh, or global leadership, uh, health of our dem democratic system, our privacy, anything that you touch somewhat relates to the Uyghur genocide. So I don't, you know, one of the things that I want people to uh, take away from reading my book is to feel, hopefully, um, that this is not only about the Uyghurs anymore, this is about the future. So if the Chinese gets away with this, uh, uh, then this will become a new normal. Uh, who, who, you know, I personally think this is too much of a problem for the world. In the last 10 years, um, uh, I'm very critical of our international system. Uh, there's no one that we can go and get this address through international uh, organization entities today. In just the last 10 years alone, um, we've seen three genocidal campaigns. The Yazidis first, and then the Rohingya, and then the Uyghurs. The United States government recognized uh, the last two as a genocide. But what is the action? So if you let this go, if this is uh, if if the perpetrators uh, suffer no cost, uh, reputational or otherwise, we will see this again. But if you stop this, the the hi historical promise never again, the treaty obligation, moral obligation, a better place for the next future can be guaranteed. So this is I think this is about um, leadership. This is about conscience. Uh, this is about future, and this is about uh, a compassion. I, you know, the Martin Neumiller's quote that I put it up at my Oslo Freedom speech. I think it's a good way to remind the audience. People sometimes feel indifferent. Uh, it's too remote, unrelated, different religious group, different ethnic group. The fact that the Jewish people feel so attached to this cause today is because they have seen it how it ends. You know, you may think that this is oh another Muslim people, another you know too far. You know, where's Central Asia? Where's? But at the end of the day, when it happened to you, you may not have a people to speak for you. So, I I I I hope um, and uh, this book will compel uh, policymakers, ordinary citizens, um, to do whatever they can, uh, lending their voices, uh, initiating new responses, uh, uh, putting in place legal tools. Uh, journalists like yourself, uh, even at a personal cost, you, you, you are one of the great examples of uh, China going after uh, individuals simply for doing their job um, to do the right thing uh, for a better future. I think that's a, a perfect place to end. Um, Nuri, thank you for your time today. And uh, thank you for this book and the work that you have done and continue to do 
on this topic. And thank you to all of you for, for joining us today here at Hudson.